So, Jazakallah Khairan Sheikh for your talk in the first segment. In your talk, you mentioned something very, very intriguing that to be honest didn't really make sense to me as well and I'm sure it didn't make sense to a lot of the people. You mentioned that there's three types of people. There's people that are married, there's people that are not married and there's people that are married and not married at the same time. Could you please elaborate on this for us, inshallah? Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahabihi ajma'in. I recall saying that right at the beginning. Do you remember? I said there are people who are married, there are people who are not married, and there are people who are neither married nor not married. And I even said that there will be some from among you who understand that. So, for example, the Quran speaks about it, and I said that Allah speaks about it. Allah says, فَلَا تَمِيلُوا كُلَّ الْمَيْلِ فَتَذَرُوهَا كَالْمُعَلَّقَةِ Under certain circumstances, when a person treats his wife in a way that he's married to her, but he's not divorcing her, he doesn't get along with her, he doesn't want to have anything to do with her, but he's just holding her for some reason, either to punish her, to say, you're not going to be divorced, I'm not going to divorce you, and I, you, you can just stay. And uh, sometimes it's just because of ego, arrogance, whatever, just a delay. So Allah says, do not turn to such an extent where you leave her hanging. And hanging there would mean that she's neither married to be able to enjoy a beautiful marital relationship with someone, nor is she unmarried that she can go to marry someone else. So she's hanging in the middle in a way that is very, very dangerous. And that would be very sinful to keep a person in that type of a, uh, you know, situation. Also, sometimes you have, and this is something that probably some of you might be in right now and you might know about it. You have a situation where you're married to someone, but they, for example, for some reason live far away. And for some obstacle, whether it is ma made by you or something you can do nothing about, they cannot come and live with you. Neither do they want to release you nor sort the problem out by perhaps agreeing on some, something that is you know, acceptable to both parties. So in both those cases, we would say the person is neither married nor not married. You have a, you know, a scenario where someone has promised to marry you, for example, and uh, you're sitting and waiting for them and they they're just delaying they say tomorrow next year the following next month following month you know the proposal will come we're going to come and they keep you waiting now in that case you're not married right but it's quite similar in the sense that you're either being fooled or yeah. you are being foolish one of the two yeah so you need to know that there is definitely this third category people who are neither married that they can enjoy a relationship nor are they unmarried that they can marry someone else. Wallahu a'ala. Jazakallah khairan, Sheikh. Now, there's a lot of youth in the crowd. I'm sure there's a lot of young sisters, young brothers in the crowd. And I think from around the age of 16, 17, maybe even younger, a lot of the youth start looking forward to getting married. 12, 12. <laughs> okay, maybe if you're 12. <laughs> no, that's just a joke. Actually, I just wanted to, to see if people were actually listening and they were. But I think you're right, like, you know, about from yeah. 12, they start developing interest and doing things. And sometimes, you know, they start engaging in immoral behavior from even earlier than 12. I mean, I've come across cases and that's why we're talking about it. But marriage, I think a little bit later. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it depends on your, your environment and so on. Anyway, go on. Let's see. So, so I want to I wanna lay out a little scenario, inshallah. And this is a very realistic scenario. There's a sister. She's seen a brother at university or at college. Seeing, you mean with, just with her eyes like that? Yes. I yes. see you. Yeah, okay. She's seen him. He's a good looking brother, mashallah. He's practicing. He prays a salah. And she would like to marry him. It can also go the opposite way, where the brother has seen a practicing sister and he likes her. He likes the way she looks. From what he's seen, she is practicing. She observes the hijab, etc. He would like to marry her. In this society, Sheikh, what is the best way for people to actually go about approaching each other? Because let's say, for example, we go by the traditional way or the strictly speaking. I just thought of something. 
Yeah. You know, in the Arabic alphabet, there is a seen. Yes. A seen. So she's seen him. Yes. Okay. So immediately after the scene, what is there in the Arabic alphabet? Sheen. What's the difference between a sheen and a scene? Three dots. Yes. Right. So she needs to tick all those three, inshallah. And then she'll have a sheen. And the sheen is obviously uh, a relationship where seeing, and then you add the H for honey, you become your honey, inshallah, right? <laughs> so basically, you're making it halal. It's also the H for halal, right? The first tick is you get your welly involved, your family members involved, someone, like I said earlier in my speech, don't donate your heart or mind to someone because they're going to hurt you. Before you donate your heart and mind, ask yourself two things. Is this within the pleasure of Allah? And have I involved my folks? Your folks, it's a very broad term. The reason is some maybe that may not have parents, some might have whoever else it is your folks. So you involve your folks from the initial stage. Someone important in your family who has a bit of authority would actually need to know that the scene would like to be converted to a sheen. You know, uh, sorry to say that, but you have to. There is no other way of it. You, you, yes, what do you want to say? But Sheikh, let's say the father is not on the scene. He's on the sod. Okay, you're getting a bit clever now, but that's fine. <laughs> so <laughs> may Allah bless you, my brother you and all of us. I mean, say, I mean. And may Allah bless whoever's in that scenario as well, because it's quite difficult. So you need to involve your brother maybe. That's why I have done something quite realistic in my speech a little bit earlier by speaking about how important it is to have a relationship with your children as parents. Mm. That's why I stressed on it so much that if your child comes to you and tells you, you know, I've seen someone, you need to show an interest in this. And I'm not just saying it out of, you know, imposing. I've done it in my own life. Where, you know, you have someone coming to say, look, I'd like you to find out more about this person. So, okay, we'll find out more about this person. And then, subhanAllah, things developed. They, they got further and so on until it had, you know, uh, whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us to do, we had to do. The reason is, we as parents, and I'm speaking as a parent, we tend to forget that the children are just an amana. They're not my belonging. No, Allah allows me to say my child, but he is in control of that particular child's entire life. He can take the child away. He can make the child a means of your hell on earth, so to speak. But uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it easy for us to communicate with our children. When they say something, listen carefully, interact, engage. And like I said earlier, don't begin to engage with your children when there is a problem alone. It should have started a long time back. We only try to involve and interfere in their lives when something happens that we don't agree with. And then we say, you should be doing this. I'm your mother. I'm your father. You were not my mother for all these years. You were not my father for all these years in the sense that you didn't fulfill what Allah told you to fulfill. And you're trying to come and involve right now by issuing an instruction. And I want to add those who have a beautiful relationship with their children that is, you know, hands on. Their children will always make them happy by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the sense that there will be beautiful communication, give and take, and you would not hold on to an opinion just because of your ego. But rather you would ask yourself, you know, what is this? Does Allah allow it? Is it okay? You know, am I just being a racist? Am I being someone who's just, you know, uh, denying the reality and so on? So you have to involve a person of your family. Unfortunately, and having been trying to help people for so many years, I've seen that where you do not involve your family, you're actually heading towards disaster, some form of a problem, a challenge. Not everyone is strong to go through things on their own. Uh, not every time is it permissible to actually do that. But uh, you know, you have to involve your folks and thereafter, uh, they will have to show a keen interest and bring the guy home. That's something that's, that I always put forward as a challenge. Bring him home. Let's meet him. If he is serious, he will come. If he's not, you know what? He's not going to come. He's going to say today, tomorrow, the next day, next month. No, he's not going to come. If he's serious. And then they say, no, I'm 15. And you know what? The guy I want to marry is 16. And you know, we, we, we're going to commit haram. We need to do our nikah now. Sheikh, help us. And I'm like, hey, hey, relax. Hold back, man. You have to have a bit of self-control here. You can't just say, I'm about 
to go for this as haram. So, Shaykh, Shaykh, help us. You know, the Shaykh begins to shake at that point, man. <laughs> it's not easy to help because what do you want me to do? You, you have uh, your desires that you're not able to actually control in the sense that, you know, you don't have restraint, which is part of your iman, supposed to be. And you're just coming to say, and a lot of the times, you know, parents are not always wrong. When they tell you, listen, this is not going to work. A lot of the times they are right. And unfortunately, I said it earlier, we learn through mistakes. Mm. A lot of the times when a parent, especially one who's been really good to you, they've, they've worked their life to let you go to school. They've paid your fees with almost all their salary or whatever else it was. They looked after you. They tried their best. They provided for you. They kept you in a beautiful way. So involve them in this decision of marriage. When they tell you, look, daughter or son, I really don't think this is the right thing. I think you're making a big mistake. You need to consider what they're saying. Speak to them. They might have a very, very good point and you will have to let go. You know, I always tell people, how many women are there on earth or men? Let's say if the population of the globe is what? Six, seven billion? Seven, yeah. Let's say half, half. For example, you know, not to be... Uh, you know, different. Let's just say 3 billion men, 3 billion women. From 3 billion, you can't see anything besides one. Khalas. That's it. One. Why? That's it. And you're just looking. And you're not, there's no marriage. Yes, once you're married, I'm sure it's your spouse, alhamdulillah, you know. But you're not married and you're just closed to the degree that you can't even, you cannot even see the weaknesses. Sometimes when we desperately want something, we are blinded to the weaknesses of that particular thing. We can't see it. So I want this desperately, but because my parents are not so happy, I begin to fight my parents. And in the process, I've actually blinded myself from all the weaknesses of this person that are glaring me in the face to the degree that one day if it does happen then it has in some people's case and then they say oh no they regret and before you know it it's all broken so i want to give a piece of advice to the parents whose children may have gone through something they were not too happy with and then they come back either divorced or with a broken relationship Open your arms, accept your child back. Because you know what? Forgive them. They made a mistake. They learned the hard way, but they're still your child. Allah brought them back. It's your responsibility. It definitely is. A lot of people, their ego prevents them from forgiving their own children. And so therefore, I know of, of a lot of cases where a person goes away. Perhaps they might have had a shari reason and the folks might not have had a shari reason to block it. So they decided to shift the wali to someone else who was an imam of a masjid or someone, you know, the... the, the whoever else uh, would do that and they got the nikah done and they began to live and then what happens is and this is not one case and i'm not speaking of a specific case wallahi thousands thousands you have the parents who then say that's it cut the relation completely we don't want to know this person hang on hang on hang on they may have children those are your grandchildren they may have a very good relationship they may be so happy Happier than they would be had they married the person you had. It has happened. A lot of people look, you know, uh, a lot of people in their families very, you know, uh, out of concern. They have an idea. You no, know, my daughter's growing up and, you know, my brother has a son or my, that uncle, he's got a, a, a grandson. This person's got a cousin. I saw that guy, you know, and I've, you've paired it up in your head. And so when your child comes up with something, it's no way. Why? Because I've got a dream. Sometimes we unfortunately even communicate that dream to the parent of that person way before our child even knew what marriage was all about. Wallahi, this is realistic. Yeah. And so we find it so difficult to pull the plug because we feel embarrassed. For that reason, we chop off our own child. Gone. What I want to encourage myself and yourselves, where your children have made a mistake, Learn to embrace them, forgive them. They will probably come back. You might have a day when you can quickly say, I think I told you and don't harp on that. You know, you have, for example, a daughter or a son, they married someone you really uh, warned them about and they still married them. And then when they come back every day, you tell them, I told you, didn't I tell you now suffer? I told you, didn't I tell you now suffer? That is absolute 
nonsense. The reason is your job as a parent is not to keep on making your child feel bad about a mistake they made. It's over, it's done. You told me once, now come on, let's move on. So my brother, as you can see, it's very, very, uh, you know, difficult uh, scenario. But I really pray, number one, that we're rightly guided. Number two, that we can take our parents seriously. Number three, that the parents can take their children seriously. And number four, when a scenario of this nature does come up, let's be realistic, you know, ask for guidance. We're living in an environment where we cannot deny that the, the ways of getting to know a person who you would be w wanting to marry have changed within the Islamic framework, but it's not exactly the old way, you know, the conventional way. It's now changed. People meet each other and they speak and they talk and they, like I said earlier, if you don't communicate, you're not going to be able to get what you want. May Allah make it easy. Ameen. Jazakallah khairan, Sheikh. There's another question to do with infatuation. So let's say there's a young man or a young woman and she's seen this one man and that's it. That's the guy for me. He has won my heart and they are stuck on this one person. They don't want to let go. And as you said, you know, they, they can't let go of, they're looking over the, the person's bad habits. They're just looking over it because they're so infatuated and kind of, they feel like they've fallen in love with this person. What advice could you give to someone in that situation? A young person in that situation. Not everyone you're impressed with initially is actually the ideal spouse. Yeah. They might be good at the uni, university or wherever else. They might be good at the workplace. But if you were to visit their home and see how they lived and meet their folks and their broader family, you would definitely wash your hands off uh, the ideas that you might be developing in your mind. I'm not saying they're not a good person. But the environment is such, you know, I have within my own home, sometimes comments fly that, you know, ha had this person known uh, how you live, perhaps how difficult it is to, to, to live with you, they would have never shown an interest in you. You know, you have comments flying around in the extended home. And so it is quite true that someone, sometimes we meet them at a common place where everything in that particular place is connected to a certain topic that, that is of concern to both of us. So for us, it seems so good, mashallah. Wait, you haven't seen the real, the real them. You know, when they're uh, not made up, number one, when they're just get up early in the morning, when how they, how, for example, how disinterested they might be in cleaning up after themselves and so many factors. So I think from the initial stage, I've said it, I'm repeating it, don't donate. I'm using the word donate because people give donations, you know. Don't donate your heart or your mind to someone until you really, really have answered a few questions. And one of them would be, it needs to be kept within the framework of Allah, yes. subhanahu wa ta'ala's pleasure, and then involve your folks. And then at the third level, you would want to actually take it a step further. And I want to raise one very interesting point that's come to mind, if you don't mind. No, of course. There is shaitan. Shaitan beautifies things that are haram. You need to know this. And what does he use? He uses halal bait. You know when you go fishing? In Africa, we fish a lot, mashallah. We actually go, I'm talking of real fish. Come on, guys. So <laughs> what we do is we get the best bait, right? And we have a rod and we cast. It's in, mashallah. And you have fish. What do they do? They see, they see a worm, they see the bait, they are confused, they bite. What was our intention? To catch. Shaitan uses the same plot with us. So it looks like food, it looks like something good. Once you bite, you're caught. And then they bring you in, they rope you in slowly but surely, and you come up and suddenly that's the fish. As you get out of the water, what happens? You die. Subhanallah. So this is what happens to us. So it starts in a haram way. You see, for example, a brother, a sister. Mashallah, good, really good. Hijab, excellent, alhamdulillah. Salah, beautiful, mashallah, you know. Everything's in order. Wow, soft-spoken, very helpful, mashallah. Up to that point, alhamdulillah, good, subhanallah. You know, whenever I say mashallah, there's a WhatsApp clip someone sent to me of a guy who keeps saying, mashallah, brother. Have you seen that WhatsApp clip? I think some of you have, right? <laughs> keeps coming to my head and I think, mashallah, brother, subhanallah. <laughs> Sorry for, for, for just adding that. I thought it would be a bit of flavor for those of you who might know it. Definitely. So, <laughs> I know what you're talking about. So you can see the guy as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hope he's not sitting in the crowd. 
Okay. <laughs> okay. So, so the point I'm raising is you say, mashallah, you're excited and so on. And then, you know, you exchange numbers or somehow you get into contact with the person. And guess what shaitan does? Shaitan makes this guy get you up for Salatul Fajr. So he messages you early in the morning, five o'clock, beep, beep. Get up for Fajr. Wow, come on. I've known of a case where they turn on the live videos to prove that I'm reading Salatul Fajr. Wow, subhanallah. And you feel so good, Masha. You did the Salah for the sake of Allah. I'm not saying no, but the guy woke you up. Number one. Number two is oh, after a time, he starts telling you, you know what? You need to give up your bad habits and you need, and you tell him and each one of you, you've helped yourself improve perhaps from a religious perspective. That was in a way a good thing. But the fact that it happened such that you're now donating your heart before you've involved your folks and your, your argument is, but this person brings me closer to Allah and then you bite and what happens? Your life is gone. Subhanallah. You've drawn in, you pulled in and you've taken out of the water. Perhaps you might start zina and you don't even know. And then you will tell yourself, but Allah is Ghafoor Rahim. Didn't you hear the lecture we heard the other day? Not going to do it again, inshallah. And the following day, okay, let's get up for tahajjud now. We do tawbah, subhanallah. Now, if you notice on one hand, it's a good thing to be reminded about doing a good thing and you feel like you've improved as a Muslim. But because you gave your heart away, that was shaitan's plan. So that's why Allah tells us, involve a third party. And make sure that the person doesn't abuse or use intentionally or unintentionally. Sometimes it's unintentional. I do know you have a genuine relationship. You really believe someone's good. They've helped you with your project. They might have helped you at school. We're being realistic here. And you start developing feelings. You yeah. need to watch out. At that stage, you're still in control. People say, but I, 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 I'm not in control of my feelings. Initially, you are. Let's not lie. Initially, you are. But it's how you allow it to go further that would actually make you enslaved by those feelings. So we need to know that it was just an example I gave that sometimes shaitan does use a trap. Be careful of these traps. And like I say, while it's good to encourage one another to become better Muslimin, but don't ever let that make you come out of the water itself. And then, you know, you've committed something that's major. May Allah forgive one and all. Amin. Amin. So Mufti, sometimes a situation happens where we've actually spoken about it. Let's say they make a mistake, they go into the marriage, it goes wrong. They split from each other, they are now divorced. The brother can very, very easily get married again. You know, he can move on. And in a lot of cases, unfortunately, the sister is left in a situation where she's finding it difficult to get remarried. How can, you know, we advise the sisters in this situation and especially our parents in the community to actually accept these people? I think it's not a question of advising the sisters more than it is advising the brothers and the families of those brothers. The reason is my brothers and sisters, this is a very emotional uh, issue. It's very close to the heart of a lot of us because, you know, the divorce rates are high, uh, not because people are bad, but because shaitan is bad. So what shaitan makes us do is when we're getting married, he makes us ignore the, the, the guidelines that we were taught and therefore we end up marrying the wrong person. When you find out it's the wrong person, uh, you try to resolve the matter. I have to say that because it's the first step. You have to try to resolve the problem and solve it and make sure that you know you, you actually uh, come to terms with the fact that I need to correct myself, give each other a little bit of time. It brings me also to another point that Sometimes what we do is the minute we have one misunderstanding, we say, right, that's it. I want out of this marriage. Not realizing that we're going to have a misunderstanding with everyone, with our own brothers and sisters and parents, with those whom we love, with everyone. We have a few misunderstandings. You don't break a relationship simply because you've had two or three misunderstandings or one. But that's what people are doing. However, if it is a major matter, you can see that both of you are heading in different directions. Uh, there are steps to follow after that where very respectfully you part ways. When you engage in or when you officiate your nikah or your marriage, you've entered into territory that will give you greater access to acts of worship 
that will result in your entry in Jannah. That's why some people say half your deen, right? You know why? Now I've got in-laws, bro, to get along with your in-laws is a mission. It's a mission. For me to be able to pull that through, I deserve Jannah, guys. Come on, come on, man. Half my Iman, whatever I've done in the past, Salah, Zakah, whatever else. I mean, that was easy, by the way. It wasn't as bad. Now, who getting along there, bro? You know, you got to say, Mashallah, Alhamdulillah, you know, you got to try your best. So it's an act of worship. Why is it called half the deen by some? Because it's not a joke, it's difficult, it's hard. You got new relatives, you got a whole line of them. Before when you traveled, you just had to buy a gift for one or two people. Now there's a line of people. If you miss one out, they say, ah, I knew she was bad, <laughs> you know? So it's really difficult. And you know, as you have all the relatives and you have to try and make amends and you know, you have to work your days of Eid out because as you grew up, you had Eid with, it, with your folks all the time. Now that you're married, What's going to happen? Where do we do the eat? It's a question that's resulted in divorce. I've had the cases. Well, you have to learn to... You have to learn to... Hello. That's where you do the eat, you see? <laughs> Mashallah. They don't even want us to tell you. Subhanallah. You have to actually learn to come to an understanding and an agreement. Either... This Eid will first go to my folks and in the afternoon, especially when you're living in one city or nearby, we'll go to my folks and in the afternoon we'll go to your folks and next Eid, we will first go to your folks and then we'll come to mine. Now, why don't you share it out? The problem is no, we've had Eid for 30 years before I married at my family. I'm never compromising that. In that case, on the day of Eid, mother goes her way, father goes his way. Or husband goes his way, wife goes her way. Is that it? Come on, you're adults. You're adults. And there are two families you need to look after, yours and hers. It doesn't mean she's a wife, so that's it. She has to do as I say. No, you need to have a good understanding. It's a day of Eid, make each other happy. What is a day of Eid all about? To spend a day of joy and happiness in the obedience of Allah with your family. What else do you want? That's what Eid is actually there for. It's a day of happiness, joy, primarily pleasing Allah. You will do an extra ibadah or two, like the salah, the khutbah, etc. And then you, you are with your family. And she is also part of your family and her family is also part of your family, whether you like it or not. So you have to actually build these relations. Now, why am I saying this? Because we're getting to divorce. When you do the nikah and the marriage, there is a door of worship, acts of worship that are open that were not open before. When you have your children, to allow them to visit your in-laws is a great act of worship because sometimes you might not get along with them completely, but you have to. They have a right. They are the grandparents or the uncles and aunts from the other side. You know, you might want to minimize if it is very bad influence. But generally, if they are slightly different, you have to put a lid on your ego. And you have to understand they are the grandchildren of these people as well. It's an act of worship. Half your deen, you see. Now, when you end up divorcing someone, there are doors that open up for ibadah and worship that were never opened before. Such as speaking good about your ex. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. That's a big one. You have to go out of your way to engage in an ibadah known as saying good about someone behind their backs. Someone asks you, what happened? The correct answer is, look, mashallah, good person. I hope I was a good person as well. We didn't get along. You know, it's a respectful answer. It might not be exactly as I said, but respectful. And if someone is keen on getting married to your ex and they want to know the details, if they were serious issues that need to be mentioned privately to a person because we're not allowed to lie when someone is about to enter into marriage with someone else. You need to know, are they asking you genuinely because they would like to know? Because half of them, they just asked you, but they've already made their minds up, you know? If that's the case, say, look, you know what? Didn't get along with me, perhaps get along with you. Wallahi, it happened at the time of the Sahaba radiallahu anhu many times when some of them would say to the others, why don't you marry such and such a woman? She was married to me, didn't get along with me, but I'm sure she was a very good person. She'll get along with you. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. And then we claim to be good Muslims. Wow, mashallah. We think it's all about 
I'm, I'm, I'm here and it's just salah. After salah, I don't care how I speak to someone. How I've seen people who are outwardly extremely pious. Extremely. And I think to myself sometimes that you know what? All that reward is going to someone else because you're busy backbiting. You're busy. You know, I received a message a few moments ago from a friend of mine in Nigeria. And I'm going to say this because perhaps they can benefit, we can all benefit. And it, the idea of the message was perhaps good in the sense that they wanted to say, look, as Muslims in our weddings, we should try and have a bit of modesty and, you know, we should behave in a, a more respectful way, etc. Up to that point, I agree. I would say that right now that as Muslims, we should be, right? We all would agree. Try and have your, you know, the day you sowing the seed of your entire future. Why do you want to make it the displeasure of Allah? That's the most powerful way of looking at it. I'm about to sow the seed for the rest of my life. The taqdeer and the predestiny, everything is coming into effect today. I'm going to be, ha be having children, inshallah. The future is going to be coming, inshallah. Allah knows about it. And on this day is the same day that everything I've done is within the displeasure of Allah. That embarrassment of the thought should be enough for me to be able to hold back and say, hang on, I can do anything but not today. Even if I'm a weak Muslim. Do you get my point? I'm, I might be weak. I'll do anything, not today. By right, we're not supposed to be doing anything anyway, any day. It's always supposed to be within the pleasure of Allah. But I'm talking of if you have a weakness, try and cut it on that day. The problem with weddings is even those who don't generally have weaknesses, they tend to think this is the, you know, when you're on diet, what do you call the one day? The cheat day, right? They tend, tend to think, okay, this is the cheat day. You can do as you want. That's wrong. So we sowed the wrong seed. So I received a message. It was okay. But then they had a photograph of people one example and another example, an example of someone who wasn't a Muslim and there was a picture of perhaps a wedding scene and another example of people who were Muslim and there was a picture of a wedding scene and they were trying to show you, look how bad the Muslims have become and look at how, and yet these are known people in society. For me, that is such a big backbiting issue that all your reward has gone to those people they probably will come out of whatever they were doing more clean than any one of us who've been forwarding those messages about them trying to give an example yet the fact that we mentioned names and had pictures is what rendered it a crime in the eyes of allah it became backbiting belittling someone for what probably the people who are forwarding messages might have in their private lives greater sins than that so if you want to correct someone, go back to Mabalu Aqwam. Go back to the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ where he generalized it. He said, look, my brothers, my sisters, there are people, perhaps we need to do this. We need to make sure that we have, a, you know, a link with Allah. We need to make sure that we don't uh, do the wrong thing, etc. So when a person is divorced, one of the greatest acts of worship is to watch the mouth, to, to uh, hold yourself back from saying that which is evil. Don't be evil. Secondly, if you have children, one of the biggest acts of worship from you that will get you inshallah into Jannah is if you can put a lid on your ego and allow access to the father or mother of the child, depending on who has that custody. It's not a joke. Not many people, even religious who read 10 salah a day, when it comes to a matter of this nature, they say, no, I know what I'm doing. What happened? What happened to all your salah? When I say 10, by the way, we're talking of the farad as well as the sunnah and the nafil and everything else. But this is the thing Allah's testing you with. There was a divorce that happened. How dare you decide that that's it, the children are mine and not yours. Allah gave them to you as a test. Come on, you have to change. You have to put a lid on your ego. The world is struggling and suffering. You cannot allow that to happen to you. You might be diagnosed with the biggest disease tomorrow morning or tonight. And then what are you going to do? May Allah grant cure to all of us who are struggling in one way or another with our health. Say Amin. So that's another point regarding your children. And thereafter, remember, the Prophet ﷺ married a few times. All of his spouses besides one were previously married. How's that? Have you ever thought of that? I think a lot of people forget. All of the spouses, besides one, Aisha radiallahu anha, she was the only one who was never married before. The rest of them, either divorced or widowed. 
Where are the men from amongst us? And more than the men, here comes the father and the mother of this guy. He is interested. He wants to marry someone and they're okay. They even meet her. And after that, they say, wow, what a lovely choice you've made and so on. And thereafter, when they find out she was previously married, they say, no, 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 no. Bilkul. You know what? This is not going to happen because it's a disgrace. How are we going to face our cousins? How are we going to face my brother and so on? Wallahi, when they children did things, they did it without consulting you, not even bothered about you. Why are you bothered about someone else? Do what is right. Are you not enough? A leader within your home to be able to lead the way for your own house? All of you are shepherds and each one of you is responsible for his flock. I don't have to worry about what the world is going to think. And we say no. Why? But she's a divorcee. Go back to the Prophet ﷺ. Look at his marriage starting with Khadija bint Khawailid radiallahu anha. And look at the others. And look at the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. Where are we? It will happen in your own home sometime later. It may. Because the tables turn. And then what? Too late. We've already destroyed people's lives. We've blocked and stopped. So I call on parents with a passion. Be careful to be judgmental. Sometimes a person who's divorced may be a million times better than an idea you have in your mind for your child. Wallahi. By the way, on a CV, when you have experience, I think you're given preference. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. That's a good one. Jazakallah khairan, Sheikh. So, just to conclude, I'd like to ask you one last question. We've spoken a lot this evening about marriage. We've spoken about, for example, let's say you see a brother or a sister, they're practicing, mashallah. But at the same time, we've also said, don't just take everything at face value. What advice, Mufti, could you give to all of the youth out here that are here, that have taken the time out to come and listen to us, may Allah bless them. What advice could you give them that these are the pointers? If you see these specific things, she's the one. If you see these specific things, he's not the one. Okay, those pointers were given by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam way back. And the thing is, uh, it's difficult to just tell the brothers and sisters that you know what, uh, he's the one or she's the one. Because sometimes the eyes through which we're looking are actually deceived by the surroundings. What that means is, I can look and I can say, wow. Why? Because what have I seen? I might have seen a proper dress code. I might have seen, oh wow, this person's read their salah. I might have heard them speak softly to me or to anyone else, you know. But I don't know if that is actually the person because you never know who a person is unless you've lived with them, traveled with them, done business with them and interacted with them in a big way, right? So it might be, we will never be able to say that's the right one. Sometimes you get a feeling and maybe it can come true later on. It has happened to people where, you know, you, you, you've just met someone and in your heart there's a feeling that you get. But you need to make a lot of dua, number one. Number two is before you actually say that is the one, get your, get your folks involved. Let someone find out a little bit more. Because for me to show you for the moment that you're seeing me every day, the best part of me is not so difficult. If I interact with uh, the people at my workplace for five hours every day, I can show them the best side of me. Go and ask my wife. She'll say, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> you don't even want to begin to know this guy from who he really is. Okay, sorry, that's not me. I'm just talking about an example, guys. Right? <laughs> but but, uh, but uh, it's a fact that sometimes you don't know. You really don't. So it's not easy, like I said, to just say that's the one. But get people involved. Find out before you donate your heart. Notice it's the fifth time I'm saying this tonight. Before you give your heart away to someone, find out a bit more. Be realistic. Don't just look at someone and say, wow. You know, wow? Because the wow, subhanallah, it's actually very dangerous, subhanallah. You can drop straight through. We are taught that, look, a person marries for a few reasons. Some people marry for looks. They see you and they say, wow. And the next thing, the rest of the letters of the alphabet are in order. You know, it's all done, mashallah. What did it start with? I just looked at her. She was so gorgeous. Wow, oh, subhanallah. Some people marry for looks. So what happens? As the looks diminish, and they do diminish as you age, mashallah, 
for a person who has looked beyond your physical, you know, your body, they will be able to see the beauty increase as time passes. As you age, they, they find you more beautiful. They find you such a lovely person. Their bond with you is filled with rahma and mawadda and sakina. It's filled with that mercy, the love. You know, you look at how this person sacrifices for me and I sacrifice for them. We've had children, we've been through ups and downs, we've gone through it and we, we love each other. We actually appreciate each other. I've kept myself from sin because I appreciate my spouse and I don't want shaitan to come between us. So the love increases, but if it's just merely outward looks, you might be in for a high jump. You know, you might be really uh, getting into something very, very dangerous. So some people marry just for wealth. And I've seen this growing. I saw once a video someone sent to me uh, trying to prove a point of some materialistic people. It's not everyone, but it's just an example. They were doing a, you know, one of those surveys or maybe not a prank, but they were just trying to figure out something. Like a social experiment. Social experiment, exactly. Jazakallah khair. So what they did is they had a guy asking a woman who was dressed in a, a very different way. Let me not use a bad word, okay? And uh, he, he tried to like sort of draw her attention and to make her come towards him. And she just flicked at him, you know, like, I'm not even interested. And he just walked a few steps, he flicked the remote, and here's his little uh, Lamborghini. Tweet, tweet. And the woman turns around and she smiles at him. <laughs> what happened? We're marrying my Lamborghini, chick. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. If that's what drew you to someone, just the Lamborghini he had, the car and the wealth he had, make sure that there is something beyond that that has drawn you to that particular person. Because I've given you an example of looks of wealth. Some people just because of lineage, ooh, I'm marrying the daughter of X. You know who that is? That's a big person. You know, he's the chef of that particular company, etc., etc. So you marry them. You don't know. You're probably just going to be enslaved into there. And you'll have to look and say, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. To your own spouse. Subhanallah. Well, we do that anyway, don't we? Alhamdulillah. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's good. For us, it's done out of love. I, I really wouldn't mind. I really wouldn't mind. If my wife were to phone me now and tell me, move to the left. I'd move to the left, even if there's no place. <laughs> out of love. That's it. So what? If that makes her happy, it makes her happy. You know, people might say, this guy is a chicken. I don't mind being called a chicken. I'll even quack quack for you a little bit, so long as she's happy. <laughs> Mashallah. Yeah, if that's what makes your marriage, let it be. I'm telling you and I know that you might be surprised. It's a reality. Subhanallah, it's a reality. However, let's get to the real, real beans. The hadith says, fad fad dini yadak. If you want true victory and success, Success will come if you've chosen the deen. If you've chosen the character, the conduct, the deen, that which Allah has asked you to look at. So that doesn't mean that you just pick someone whom you say, look, the deen is really good, but you see, um, I, I really cannot get along with this person because I don't know. There has to be a bit of chemistry. Yeah. Allah's made everyone handsome and pretty. There's no one who's ugly and not good looking. But it's in the eyes of the beholder. I might like a person of a certain, you know, size, shape. It's okay. It's fine. It's my liking. Allah's put it in my heart. But someone else might like something totally different. I mean, sometimes you find the young people saying, Ooh, she's hot. And you try to think, what? <laughs> you know, it just goes to show. So the hadith says, if you want success, you, you can look at the family if you want. You can look at the wealth if you want, but that's not the deciding factor. You have to look at looks as well. You have to look, because there has to be a bit of chemistry. I mean, I can't tell you, listen, marrying you, but you know what? You're going to have to um, put on a niqab in the bed as well. <laughs> the guy, by the way. Isn't that biology, Sheikh? Sorry? Biology. Subhanallah, subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us. Imagine one of the guys and the wife tells you, listen, don't, don't like what you look like, you got to cover your face. I mean, may Allah forgive us. It might be a silly example, but I'm drawing it in order to show you that there has to be a slight bit of chemistry. 
And then, inshallah, you know, you get the people to confirm it, your family, inshallah, involved and so on. As time passes and you're making an istikhara, brother, we'll spend two minutes on this. I've just thought of something very important. As time passes and you're making an istikhara, one of two things is going to happen. Either things are going to become easy or things are going to become difficult. If things become easy, that's the response of your istikhara positively. If things are going to become difficult, it's the response of your istikhara negatively. Remember, when you make a dua of istikhara, we we'll all have a misunderstanding that you're going to dream something. 99% of the time, you don't dream anything. Remember that. So it's not like, you know, revelation is going to come through your dream and you see that, that that's it. No, you did not read the meaning of the dua. That's why you don't even know what you asked Allah for. The dua says, Oh Allah, if this is good for me, make it easy for me. Give me barakah in it and let it happen for me. So you get up in the morning and everything is not happening. Why? Because the other part of the dua that you made in the dua of istikhara is, Oh Allah, if it's not good for me, create a barrier between me and it. Take it away from me, make it difficult and make me happy with what you've decreed. So everything becomes very, very difficult. That's the response of your istikhara. It's in the dua. So go back and read the dua and you'll understand. People say, you know, it's becoming so difficult, but I've dreamt and I've had so many dreams. My sister, my brother, a lot of the people have already slept with each other before they're doing istikhara. Do you not think your istikhara is going to be tainted with whatever has happened? I mean, you're crazy watching her, talking to her or him every single day, thinking that that's not going to have an impact about your dreams and everything, your thoughts and whatnot. You need to know what's the meaning of istikhara. And if you've already made your mind up, don't waste your time making an istikhara. Because then you're not going to follow it. And another very interesting point is istikhara, you know, for those of you who might not know what it is, it's to seek the guidance of Allah regarding a matter that you are confused about. So if you're not confused about it, it's inapplicable. You don't have to do it. I'm not confused. Things are one plus one is two. I don't need to do an istikhara for that because it is two, you see. But where I'm confused, you're saying, oh Allah, I don't know, you know. Please guide me, help me. By that time, have you or have you not donated your heart? If you have, I don't see how it's applicable. You see? If you haven't, it becomes applicable. Then you, if, if it's a no, you're going to back off. The problem is a lot of us, <laughs> we put the, the cart before the donkey and what do we do? We try and do an istikhara when everything is already over. It's all decided and done. So my brothers and sisters, um, I go back quickly to recap the, the question that was asked about when do you know that it's right? There comes a stage during the whole process when you know it's right. And sometimes people get engaged. It's not wise to prolong an engagement. Actually, if you prolong an engagement, what you're asking for is shaitan to come in. Because they say you can marry four years from now. But I know who I'm going to marry and it's going to be four years. Imagine all those four years, what's going to happen? Do you think the young men and women today, the majority of them have the capacity to stay away completely? Let's be realistic. Minimum is they'll be sharing images and having video talks and sometimes, you know, the guy will loosen a button. It's a reality. And the next thing she'll say, oh, I like your chest. And then he'll take off his jersey and it, it happens. Why? Because shaitan is there. And who is to blame? The people who have decided to delay that nikah, when they knew, we're happy. The, this side is happy, that side's happy, but no, four years later, you have to get your job. And I've interviewed parents whom themselves have not had jobs when they were married. It's ironic. Our own parents, when they married, they didn't own a home. They didn't really have a solid income. They probably never had proper jobs. But mashallah, they married, they were happy, they had us, we're okay. When we want to marry, they say, no, the guy needs a job. I mean, where's the, where, why is it so much, you know, hi hypocrisy? So we need to know if an engagement has happened and you begin to have negative thoughts, break it. Did you hear what I just said? Yes. Break it. Cancel it. It's easier to break it at that stage than to wait to get a nikah done and to, to have children, innocent ones who are going to be caught in the turmoil. So my beloved parents, if your children want to call off the engagement, 
support them. Talk to them initially. You might want to know why. You might want to guide them. Yes. But if they want to call it off, don't say, I spent so much money because you're going to spend even more money. And then it's going to break when it's going to make you cry tears of blood. So rather do it now. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us and help us. It's a very tough topic, but I have not minced my words. Jazakumullah khair. Jazakumullah khair, Sheikh. I think if we were to put it in one sentence, it would be don't donate your heart without knowing what you're donating to. 100%. Jazakallah khair, mashallah. Jazakallah That's the khair. message I've been driving home today. Starting off the Q&A, inshallah. Uh, Mufti, I'd like to ask a question that I've gotten, which is, there's a brother, he married this sister, and while them being married, the sister has been living alone for some time, two years. And now what's happened is, the brother doesn't really want to do anything with that relationship. He doesn't want to divorce her, he doesn't want to, he's just leaving her there. So she's kind of in a situation where she's in limbo. She feels as if she's married to the guy, but at the same time, it's not a proper marriage. What can you advise in a situation like this? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I think what's important for us to know is that women, they actually do have rights that they don't know of sometimes. So if, for example, the, the brother is not fulfilling the rights of the sister, like he's not living with her and a long time has passed, or he is not providing for her and a long time has passed, she can actually apply if she wishes and if she has not been able to resolve the matter, she can apply to nullify that particular marriage in something known as something known as a fasq, right? So that nullification will have to be done by the ulama, uh, perhaps in the area that she lives in. Like here, you have the council, uh, I think it's called the Sharia Council. What's it called? The Sharia Council, Islamic Sharia Council, they can actually nullify the nikah. So even if the brother does not cooperate with them, after a period of time, they will issue a nullification. That nullification is worth one irrevocable talaq, which means that she will be divorced from him in a way that if he wants to get back to her, they would have to have a new nikah done with her approval. So there is a way out. When the rights of a woman are not being fulfilled, she has... Uh, if she cannot solve the problem and he is being arrogant or he does not want to issue the talaq, she can apply for that and she will be awarded it, especially if your council uh, in your locality knows exactly what they're doing. And as time is passing and we're becoming more and more advanced, the councils are also becoming a little bit more advanced and they're doing processing time is becoming less and inshallah it's more effective yeah jazakallah khairan sheikh brothers and sisters we'll start off the q a inshallah we'll give the first mic to the brother here at the front mashallah yes. brother what is your name and what is your question for the sheikh inshallah yes uh, akhi. <laughs> my question uh, you've mentioned about uh, the, the relationship between a parent and child what is the role of a sibling how can they what should they be doing Jazakallah khair, the, the, the role of a sibling. I think the siblings, it's a very important question. The siblings need to support. They need to support what is right uh, in terms of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordained. So if, for example, you have uh, your brother, your sister wants to do something, your parents uh, are not permitting it to happen, for example, and you know that your parents are wrong, you should very respectfully guide your parents. So with us, we're taught that our, our parents are owed respect to the degree that we're not allowed to uh, disrespect them. But that doesn't mean we have to agree with everything that they're doing. So if they're wrong, you can respectfully highlight to them that they are wrong. Another very interesting issue about a sibling, we have a culture. Uh, I think we're, we can hear some of the sisters speaking into the mic at the back there. Uh, we have a culture that the eldest must marry first. That's a culture that is un-Islamic. It has nothing to do with Islam. It's just a culture. It makes life difficult for those who are younger who want to marry before the older person. So your siblings, you need to make sure that you teach your parents if they do not know or you encourage them if they are just worried about what people will think that you know what, if my brother or sister who is younger than me would like to get married, 
and I am not yet married, then you can actually have their marriage prior to ours. And the culture uh, that, that actually uh, makes it prohibited would have to be sidelined. Although, obviously, by nature, it is better to have the older marrying first, but it's not a condition and it's not necessary. Jazakumullah khair. If I can pause for a moment, we can actually hear the sisters speaking into the mic. The sister who has the microphone at the back, can you hold it away from you? Because it is distracting us, inshallah. Okay. Jazakallah khairan, Sheikh. Also, if I could ask all of the brothers and the sisters to settle down, inshallah, as we have started this segment, and it is from the correct adab to settle down and to listen, inshallah, when everything is taking place. Uh, to continue, I think we'll take a question from the sisters now, because we took one from the brothers. Sister, if you can say your name and your question, inshallah. Um, my name is um, Iman, and I have a question about your Iman. So my question is, what does one do when their Iman decreases so much that when they're praying, like, you feel empty, like the connection isn't as, there, as it was before with Allah? Like, how do you go about rectifying that and getting it back? Okay, sister, the question is not uh, related to our topic, uh, but still I will take it because one might argue that it is in the sense that if your iman is weak, perhaps, you know, you might create issues for yourself in your relationships, etc. I think uh, it's, it, it has approach from various angles based on your own uh, surroundings and what has caused that generally. Uh, if you declutter your mind, if you try your best to remove from your mind and heart that which is unnecessary and that which is holding you down, then it will help you develop your relationship with Allah. When, when that happens, you develop your relationship with people around you who are uh, strong in their iman or at least they will encourage you in that direction. When, you, when the circle of your friends uh, is not bothered about the deen or Allah or what's right and wrong or their duties unto Allah, generally it will become easier for you to turn away from Allah or to become distant from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if those around you all give it the importance, they enthusiastic about it, you know, they, they support you, encourage you, they have good words, then it would actually help you also to uh, fulfill what you have to with enthusiasm and iman. Similarly, when you have a reminder every now and again from someone or a, you know, uh, a source that would actually be of motivation to you, the motivation actually helps. At the time of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, they used to actually go and say, let's increase our iman for an hour. You know, by listening to the Prophet or the Sahaba or by learning something and increasing that particular uh, motivation that they had. Once you're motivated, you need to act upon it almost instantly because like today, we heard something. If we don't act upon the good of it, it's going to diminish over a period of time. They say within 48 hours, if you haven't acted upon something motivational, perhaps it's going to die down without you uh, doing anything about it in any way. So it's important for us to listen to that which motivates us also to increase your remembrance of Allah. Because the remembrance of Allah definitely will impact upon you. There is one problem we have when we don't speak the Arabic language. We, we tend to pay lip service to a dhikr without thinking of what it means. So we say Alhamdulillah without actually considering that it actually means pray, all praise is due to Allah. Praise be to Allah. So if you were to remember Allah in a way that your, the words you are uttering, the meaning of them are close to your heart. Uh, in that way, you would be able to, uh, inshallah, uh, help yourself with your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Similarly, I have found that seeking the forgiveness of Allah actually draws you closer to Allah. And being convinced that Allah has forgiven you, that is a very powerful, powerful point. If you are convinced within yourself that I've done wrong, but Allah has forgiven me because I sought forgiveness of Allah genuinely, it makes you feel like you're a clean person. It makes you feel like, you know, you have hope and so on. So this would motivate you to do more for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What I've mentioned, these are just some tips regarding developing yourself, your iman, your relationship with Allah. But the topic is very, very vast. Jazakallah khairan, Sheikh. 
We'll answer this question because some of the sisters, uh, they may be shy to come up and actually ask the question in the mic. So uh, we, we have a written question here. Sheikh, I must warn you, this is a question that will probably be very, very beloved to the hearts of many of the sisters. The question is, what is the guidance on adding a clause in the nikah contract? I.e. my husband cannot marry another woman whilst he is married to me. I think it's a sign of insecurity, to be honest with you. Uh, you know, we should be so confident with ourselves and our iman and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and our relationships that uh, as much as some might argue, there are two opinions. You know, some of the scholars say it's allowed because uh, it's up to you. And some of them say, well, it's not allowed because it goes against the very grain of the reason of getting married. So that, that fiqhi jurisprudence argument is in its place. I don't want to side with any one of them, but I would believe that, you know, uh, I found people then doing things behind the backs of their wives. I am one who doesn't promote or demote uh, something of this nature, uh, meaning if a person marries again or not, it totally depends on them, their situation, their surroundings, their environment, whether it's feasible or not. I've seen really, really beautiful homes shredded to pieces and totally destroyed because of um, another marriage. And I've seen others where it has brought so much of goodness and support and love that it's unbelievable, you know. So I'm no one to promote or demote. I don't know your particular situation. You might just be diving into something that's going to mess the rest of your life. So you need to actually think very deeply. You need to have built, the, you know, uh, the whole situation. You cannot just come home one day and say, that's it, it's happening, you know. So putting a clause is a little bit tricky. I, I cannot really, I, I don't even want to encourage that because if that's the case, you know, we might have another 20 clauses to put sometimes and, you know, people will start adding all sorts of clauses. But like I said, from a, from a jurisprudence perspective, there is difference of opinion whether it is a valid clause or not a valid clause. So if the guy really wants to do it, he's going to tell you, listen, according to such and such a scholar, it's not even a valid clause. So there you go. I think, like I said, it's a sign of insecurity. I mean, you might disagree with me. I really don't mind. Because, you know, it's just my opinion. It may be a sign that, you know, if I were to, to put a clause to say you cannot do that, you know, I think it would say a lot about me. I'm so insecure that I really feel that I'm not, you know, I'm, if this might happen and so on. But look, at the end of the day, you know your situation. People might want to add it for whatever reason. If the guy's agreed, uh, he, he comes to ask, then asking us another ruling to say, am I allowed to break the clause? You know, what, what are the damages? What would happen? And like I say, there is a sickness that I can talk about, totally away from this. Society sometimes is more forgiving when it comes to something haram than when it comes to halal. And that's actually a trap of the devil. So when it comes to something haram, people are quick to say, well, it's okay, it's fine, you know, he did this and it's okay. It's okay with you, but was it okay with Allah? And then sometimes when something is okay with Allah and not okay with society, society really is unforgiving. They say, no way, it's not happening. And I, I think we need to deal with our own iman. I think we need to deal with our own uh, situation, connection with Allah. The problem we're facing, and I can tell you a reality, a lot of guys out there, they, they haven't lived a proper life with their own spouses. They haven't shown that they're loving and kind and supportive and so on. And yet they're busy, uh, you know, trying to look into other avenues of, get, of increasing the number of wives they have when they haven't even... Uh, proven themselves as an as a person or as a good husband uh, in, in in the in the case that is there uh, Some people use that as, a, as an excuse to say well, you know what how are you gonna do justice to them when you haven't even done justice to one sometimes it's just a statement they say in order to get out of it, but what we definitely should know is and I'm going back to what I started with I cannot give you a ruling to say Guys, do it or don't do it. It all depends on a such. It's not something farad. Remember that. It all depends on your situation, your uh, you know environment, your family, your surroundings, uh, everything around you. Uh, th that might make it the biggest mistake in your life, or it might be the best thing you've ever done. So that's what it is. May Allah Subhanahu wa Taala guide us in a way that people don't need to make conditions when marrying but rather in a way that people trust us so much that we will be the most loving, most kind people. And, and I challenge you, you know, I, I always tell myself, a few moments ago I was signing some books and I felt so hurt in my heart to tell some of the sisters that sisters, I've got to stop here because 
the word stop actually, you know, is such that it hurts people. It hurts people when you cut off something, when you stop something good, you know. And I was feeling, let me try and be the best person I can. But sometimes while trying to be the best person, you get trampled all over. And some of the best of us, we struggle and suffer emotionally because we allow everyone to walk all over. And when we try to stand up for ourselves for the first time, we're looked at as the bad ones. It happens in a lot of homes where you have a person who's slaving it, if I can use that word, for years on end. And one day they stand up for what is right. And they're told, how dare you so ungrateful. You so I've been grateful for the last 15 years. Hello. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. I hope we don't have, you know, some of the tyrants in our midst who actually make life such a misery for people who live with them. That's the case. This is the day when we can change, inshallah. We, we need to make life beautiful for those we're with so that Allah will make it beautiful for us in the dunya and the akhirah. Imagine if you make life easy for someone in this world, Allah says we will make life easy for you here and in the hereafter. What if it's your own family? May Allah make us role models. Amin. I mean, Jazakallah khairan, Sheikh. We'll take a question from the brothers, inshallah. Brother, what is your name and what is your question for the Sheikh, inshallah? So, um, so this is a big thing today, society. And oh, my, my name is Wasim. <laughs> um, so this is a big thing to, thing in today's society, and I'm sure a lot of you can relate to. So, Brother Musa touched earlier upon if you see someone in the common place, whether it's a college, university, workplace, and you're interested. Um, you said to get the folks involved, but even before that stage, um, to get to know the person in a, in a good way, because you have to get to know the person and she has to get to know you, etc. How do you do so in a halal manner? Because I'm sure a big thing that people, don't, uh, people need to look at is limitations, and that's like some sort of framework on how to do that realistically in this day and age. <laughs> Jazakallah, brother handsome, uh, sorry, brother Wasim. I just translated, <laughs> I just translated your name into English, mashallah. Okay, a good name, mashallah. Jazakallah uh, khair, Habibi. I want to tell you that, you see, there is a difference. Uh, the Islamic teaching tells you to get to know someone with the assistance of your folks. The problem is our folks don't help. I think that th that's really an issue where our folks sometimes, they don't help us to get to know someone because they have their own ideas. So we're faced with a challenge where people start getting to know others with the idea that if I'm going to get to know them, and if it's okay, then I'll involve my family. So they have good intentions, but in the process of getting to know someone, the emotions run high. You've donated your heart without even knowing it's donated, gone. It's out of your, your own bosom and it's gone somewhere else. And by that time, you now want to go back to your family and tell them something and you've actually already drowned, if you know what I mean. So in Islam, we're taught to get to know someone. Yes, indeed. And you are allowed to get to know, you know, as much as you'd like to, prior to the marriage on condition that you've involved the folks who are supposed to be involved in the case of a sister for example someone respectable i mean it's i am i have advocated and i have done it today and every other day for when i've spoken about marriage for parents to become involved and to try and take seriously what their children bring up to them and so if someone says, listen, dad, you know, there's a guy interested in me. He's really, are you interested in, in him? Well, yeah, I think so. I want to get to know him. Well, dad, you know what? I think if it's not haram, you need to help because people will be doing things behind your back. Wallahi, I want to swear by Allah that every other day I have an email of someone telling me that they are marrying someone they do not want to marry. They're in total and absolute love with someone else, but their parents are forcing them. And I'm thinking we're living in the 21st century. How can we allow that as Muslimin? How does it reflect upon Islam and the Muslims? And then you want to complain that we have a divorce and, 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 and so on. I have people who, are, who have told me and hundreds of them, if not thousands, that my father has just forced me to get married and I don't want to marry. I don't have anyone in mind, but I don't want to marry this guy. How can we call ourselves Muslims who fear Allah? What representation are we providing for, for what we stand for? Subhanallah, people will think of Islam and Muslims as being backward and so yet we're not. We're promoting the fulfillment of the rights of your own kids, your own children. So my brother, quickly getting back to what you were saying, Islam teaches us to involve 
before you get to know the person just on your own, the two of you are sitting, shaitan is the third as we're taught. But if you, if you involve someone, you know, you, you may have interactions with them. You have to interact with the opposite sex. That's something we need to know. Whether it's your mother, your sisters, a strange person, some, you, there will come a time in your life you have to interact even with someone who's a total stranger. That interaction, Islam doesn't say it shouldn't be there. It says it needs to be within that which is respectable and acceptable. That's it. I mean, I've met millions of people, women, a lot of them who are not related to me at all. For as long as it's respectable, within the limits, acceptable, we've greeted, we've helped, we've spoken to, we've tried, you know, wherever possible, we've, you know, we've helped. And the same applies to all of us. I mean, if you see someone on the street, for example, they need help, you as a Muslim should be the first one to rush to, to help them. You, know, you don't say, no, I'm not a mahram, I'm, I'm running away. And you wait for someone who's not even perhaps a Muslim or maybe an Islamophobe to come and laugh and do something that is nasty. May Allah protect us. So this is why we say society, sometimes we need to understand the deen and what we're taught rather than you know, just doing what we think, which is not even a part of the deen. So sometimes, like I say, you have to interact with the opposite sex. You get to know them. There comes a point when, look, I need to involve someone here because I want to know a little bit more. So that would help. May Allah make it easy for us. Jazakallah khairan, Sheikh. We have a question here from a sister. May Allah bless her. She's mentioned that she got married to this brother. Her father approved of the marriage. Everything was fine. But because her father didn't like the brother and he just approved of the brother just because, you know, the sister wanted to marry him. Now what the father is doing and the, the family are doing is they don't want to accept the, the son-in-law. They're saying, we don't really want to know him. You've married him, no problem. You live with him, but we don't want to know him. We don't want to welcome him into our home. What advice would you give in a situation like this, Sheikh? I think the most serious advice I can give because it's on the increase, this type of problem is happening a lot. Uh, my beloved parent, if you are a person who has just accepted for it and then you, you, you have turned away, you are failing your test with Allah. What if Allah turns away with you the same, uh, turns away from you the same way you turned away from your, this child and the spouse on the day of judgment? And you are told you didn't want, you turned away, we're going to turn away from you. The hadith says, when you make life easy for someone, we're going to make life easy for you. When you make life difficult for someone, we're going to make it difficult for you in the dunya and the akhirah. So you need to know, if you did that to your own child and your own ch child-in-law, meaning whether it's a son-in-law, daughter-in-law, and you, you turned away from them, because of that, I promise you, you will taste the evil effect of your own deeds in your life before you die. And I can almost guarantee that. You will taste it before you die. Allah will show you the, 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 the evil of your deed within your life somehow. And we've seen this happening because helpless people, the dua they make is answered by Allah way before everybody else. The hadith says, You need to fear and be scared of a supplication made against you by someone whom you have wronged for indeed there is no barrier between that supplication and Allah so what I want to say you fail your test why do that embrace the guy give him a chance let him prove himself perhaps he might turn out to be better than you and closer than you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yet your action is proving that you have actually not put Allah before everyone else but rather your own ego your own pride we need to set that aside may Allah never let that happen to us and whoever it is happening to may Allah bless your parents and guide them and soften their hearts to be able to uh, stop themselves from doing that barakallah fiqh jazakallah khairan sheikh for answering that question we'll go straight to the sisters inshallah sister what is your name and what is your question for the sheikh um, Salaamu Alaikum, my name is Hafsa Shukawi. Um, in regards to marriage, my question is, how should one go about seeking blessings for marriage by their parents when difference in skin color could potentially be an issue? Subhanallah, my sister, it's a very interesting question because 
uh, a lot of the times the child knows the parents better than anyone else. So you've got to actually try and convince them through means that they would be convinced by because you've lived with them all your life. If not, what I have found helpful is uh, to be able to very respectfully involve members of the family who are senior and looked up to by the parents to try and talk to them. The difficulty today is parents say no. And the reason why they're saying no, they're thinking of what will people say. I promise you it's a big disease. What's my community going to say? What's my family going to say? What's everyone else going to say? And in the process, they don't allow their children to live a life. And the same people that they are worried about what they would say when their children have to do something, they get it done. You know, I know of a case where there was a family that did not accept a brother because he was a revert. And they said, no way, he's revert. What an insult. Astaghfirullah. I told them all the Sahaba were reverts, by the way. <laughs> all the Sahaba were reverts. All of them, 100% of them were reverts. So what's the problem here? And they said, no, no. You know, my brother, he told me if this happens, our relationship is over. Three years later, three years later, the child of this particular man married a non-Muslim, subhanallah, non-Muslim, and invited the entire family. And guess what? Everyone went, subhanallah. I don't want to comment about that. I want to say the double standards is, look, you didn't allow something and look at what's happened this side here. And then people started asking fatwas to say, is this allowed? Is that allowed? Big issue. Moral of the story is sometimes when you try to block something halal, what did I tell you earlier? In your life, Allah will show you something to prove to you that you just failed your test dismally. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. I know you might be asking, how can this happen? How can that happen? The only reason I'm citing it to you is, I'm citing it because raising that example to say, here is a sister asking us, how do we convince our parents? Some of the parents are not easy to convince. Uh, you know, and then like I said, you involve some of the family members who are senior. Sometimes you might want to involve an imam or someone whom your parents look up to. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes there is no one they look up to. So in certain cases, we really cannot offer that type of help, the help of convincing. I have tried sometimes to, you know, uh, assist, like I told you, in a lot of cases where we've spoken to parents. MashaAllah, some of them come through, some of them don't come through. Some of them have valid reasoning. Some of them don't have valid reasoning. Some of them are ridiculous. And you can taste the pride as soon as you just try and say, Salaamu Alaikum. And they just look at you. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And you say, okay, guy, you know, this guy doesn't want to be helped at all. But you got to try because you know why? When you try, you have fulfilled your duty. And it's written against that person's name with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah make it easy for all of us. Another very important point, make lots of dua. Call out to Allah, don't lose hope, but watch in which direction things are moving. So may Allah make it easy. Jazakallah khairan mufti. We'll take another question from the sisters inshallah. So sister, what is your name and what is your question for the Sheikh today inshallah? Assalamu alaikum. Um, this is Um Najiba. I have a question. Um, we often hear when a proposal comes that, uh, mashallah, the sister wears hijab and jilbab, she is practicing. Or the brother has um, beard, wears thobe, he is practicing. Um, does it define um, wearing jilbab or hijab or having beard? Does it define practicing? So could you please enlighten us with the real definition of a practicing Muslim? Jazakallah. Jazakumullah khair and I will give you an answer that inshallah you will be satisfied with by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because we've tackled this issue before practically. Uh, being a practicing brother or a sister should refer to two things, the inward and the outward. So some have managed to actually only deal with one of them and some have managed to deal with both. And every one of us uh, is trying to become better uh, and improve where our weaknesses are. So when you see someone outwardly, it does not necessarily mean that that person is practicing, but it means they are practicing outwardly. 
Let's be honest. They're practicing outwardly. So we would like to hope that the inside is a reflection of the outside. Unfortunately, it's not always the case. So don't be fooled. So while I'm not belittling the outward practicing of a brother or a sister, I have to warn one and all, including myself, that that is not the only mark to look at, but rather there needs to be other factors that would actually make you make your mind up regarding marriage, for example. And at times you have a person who's struggling a little bit with their outward practicing, but you have an interaction with them that proves to you that they have some beautiful qualities in them that show that internally they are really God-fearing people, but they're struggling with their outward practicing. It does happen and it happens a lot, especially where parents are very strict. Sometimes people are outwardly practicing due to the strictness of their parents and not necessarily because they themselves would like to practice. So sometimes you have a person from a modern home. No one's putting any pressure on them. None of the people in the home, you know, are even talking about dress or anything else. And that person makes sure they fulfill their salah, they make sure, but the way they were brought up, perhaps they didn't give so much of importance to that which was outward. So I'm not saying outward uh, appearance and all that is not important, but I am saying you've got to give credit to this person who actually grew up in an environment where they were lovely, honest, upright individuals. They just need a little bit of perhaps movement this way, that way, and who doesn't? Who doesn't need? We all need that movement, inshallah. So it's very, very tricky to answer your question. The outward appearance is not only what you should be considering because it does not depict anything besides outward practicing. It does not confirm your inner. The inside actually needs to be confirmed through other means. Wallahu a'lam. Jazakallah khairan, Sheikh. We have our brother here, mashallah. Akhi, if we can get your name and your question for the Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. I am Karamo, Karamo Cham. My question today is based on this. Some of us came from somewhere else, and there are lots of sisters who also are in the same situation. They don't have family here, nor do they have close friends. And we're talking about nikah here. Can we throw a light on this secret marriage? Can we have nikah where it's only me and her and no one else? Because this is, might be based on a personal question. Thank you very much. My brother, Jazakallah Khair. I really, my, my heart goes out to those who are perhaps from abroad, they're here alone and they don't know, perhaps people are not ready to marry them, they don't know much about them, etc. It really is difficult. But the question about secret marriages, I need to tell you, that before I get to that, someone had asked me a question. We were talking about it earlier backstage. That young people, it's becoming very common. They say, we did our nikah. And you ask them, well, how was it done? They say, well, he put a mahar in front of me. And he asked me if I would be his wife. And I said, yes, I would. I said, and who was the witness? So the answer is the greatest witness of them all. I say, who is that? He says, Qul kafa billahi bayni wa baynakum shahida. Isn't Allah sufficient as a witness between you and I? So Allah was the witness and Allah witnessed it. Okay, don't let the devil make you think that that's a nikah. That's actually invalid. There is no way in the Quran or the Sunnah that a marriage can be officiated without proper human being witnesses. There needs to be human beings. Allah will witness the witnessing of the human beings and He has witnessed it. But He has asked you to have human beings as well to bear that witness. So if you have the minimum witness of two males, although technically the marriage is done, when, I, when we speak about not going beyond that, like I have heard scholars talk about it in my circles and they say, if you do a nikah properly, it can never be a, a secret because the minimum announcement is the witnesses. It was announced to them. They saw it. But what you are meaning to me is 
you did the nikah correctly, like you have the, the, you have the ijab, the qabul, the witnesses, the mahar, you know, the proposal, the acceptance, and the wali may be there as well, but no one else knows about it. Well, I can tell you something, from a correctness point of view, for the nikah, if the wali is involved, the witnesses are involved, the mahar is there, the proposal is there, the acceptance is there, technically it may be a valid nikah, but from a social perspective, it wouldn't be a wise thing to do. The reason is, the whole idea of getting married is, so that people can now know this relationship is halal, and now everyone's going to look at you, wow, you see, they don't even know if it's halal or not. You know, they, obviously when we see couples, we would, we would immediately presume that they're married. That's what we're taught. But you're going to be ducking, diving, hiding. And I tell the sisters, a lot of the times when you, uh, when you become, meaning when you're ready to have a secret without anyone knowing, you're heavily abused thereafter without you being able to do anything in a lot of cases, in a lot of cases. And the reason is sometimes I know of someone who says, listen, you know what, you marry me and, and it's fine. I will, you know, you can just see me once a week, once a month, once every six months. And uh, that's it. It's fine. I don't really need anything more than that. You know, I promise you a week passes, two weeks passes and you start thinking, gosh, I've got a husband, but I don't even see him. And now the pressure comes and it starts mounting. And I tell you what, you start thinking, no, I need to see him more often. You start arguing because you want what you've agreed. When you live it, you realize you, you were foolish. When you start living the reality, you start realizing, you know what? I was foolish. I'm just being used. That's what's happening. I'm just being abused. That's what's happening. So you need to understand. You need to weigh the pros and cons correctly. I would not get involved in something of that nature as as far as possible, try and keep it open. You know, be brave enough to say, let the world know. So what? And uh, sometimes circumstances might, might make us not want to tell everyone, but we need to at least announce it within a specific circle. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy. Once again, I reach out to all those who are from, you know, other countries. Perhaps you might not have people around you. May Allah make it easy for you to marry. And, uh, you know, I always like to encourage the Imams of the Masjid to say, please look out for those brothers and sisters who need to get married and try and hook them up with someone who perhaps they could also have as a spouse. Wallahu a'lam. Jazakallah khairan mufti. We're going to take our final question, inshallah, from one sister. I do apologize to everyone that has been queuing up. We know that you have tried to ask your questions. But unfortunately, if we were to cater for everyone's questions, we would be here all night and maybe more than that. So we'll take our last question from the sister standing there. Sister, what's your name and what's your question for the Sheikh today, inshallah? Assalamu alaikum. My name is Fumida. Um, basically, I'm looking to get married. Okay, so I've done a thick course in marriage. And my ustad, he was saying to the brothers, um, men don't want to marry career-minded women and to me it seems a bit like you're demotivating those women because how do you know what the intention of those women are for example I want to be a, a psychologist because um, I know that anxiety and depression is very common in the Muslim community and only Allah knows my intention. Now, having brothers say that basically, oh no, you working is not good for my religion and not good for my you know, children. What's wrong with that? I don't get it. What's wrong with career-minded women? MashaAllah. Jazakumullah khair. Uh, my sister, I think the, the scholar who might have uh, said that is probably speaking about himself. Uh, because I know of many brothers who are sitting right here right now whose wives are well within their careers and probably even supporting them and, and they share the burden and the load and so on. So uh, I don't think we can say blanket that, you know, brothers do not like uh, women with a career. But maybe we can say there are brothers who may not like, I mean, it's their liking, their preference. And there are brothers who do and do, who don't mind, for example. And I think as the years are passing, more and more people are beginning to understand that, you know, if your spouse and yourself, if you have to work within a good environment that is acceptable to both of you, uh, it might even help in other ways. Sometimes there is a lot of boredom that occurs if a woman is just to sit doing nothing. 
it could help in that way. And another thing is you could assist also with the burden of uh, the livelihood and the living because it's not cheap anymore. So I don't think it's right for someone to just uh, issue a statement on behalf of all the males to say that they prefer this and they prefer that. Because like I said earlier, men prefer all different things. What I prefer, someone else might not. And what someone else prefers, you know, I might not. And that's what makes the world a lovely place because Allah's made us all different. We will fit in somewhere by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So uh, I hope that answers your question. You know, we, we, the men who are here, I think we don't really agree um, with a blanket ruling to just paint every one of us with that brush. I mean, Brother Musa is nodding his head here. A few of the others here are also nodding their heads. Uh, they are prepared to marry a woman who has a career. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. May Allah bless us all. Uh, obviously, if the career, like, you know, sometimes you have a job, male or female, if your spouse is not comfortable with the job you have, I think the two of you can discuss it. And maybe you want to make adjustments in order to give preference to your marriage over your, your, you know, the exact place where you might be working. Because sometimes it does happen. Even with the brothers, the wife is not comfortable because of what goes on at your workplace or something. You need to talk about it, discuss it, and maybe make realistic changes if needed. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all. I've really enjoyed myself. It's really been a very, very uh, long day. But I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving me the opportunity to interact with you guys. And I still have a few of those whom I've promised inshallah to sign their books. Uh, I will do that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you ease. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum.